So welcome uh, to a lecture within the Philosophy Colloquium. Uh, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome Professor Thomas Kuhut uh, today, who is a historian. Uh, it just shows how interdisciplinary philosophy really is. Uh, and I just wanted to mention before I start that uh, the talk is co-sponsored by the Department of History and the Mac McFarland Center. And in this respect, I wanted to particularly thank the Ream Library uh, Family Fund uh, for sponsoring uh, and supporting uh, this endeavor financially. Uh, but uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Professor Kohut, uh, who is a German historian and uh, also very much uh, involved in psychoanalysis. Uh, he worked and wrote books, uh, two books on German history, uh, on Willem II and the Germans, a study in leadership, and uh, a German generation in experiential history of the 20th century. And more recently, he has come out with a very, very nice book on empathy and historical understanding of the human past. And since empathy is close to my heart, uh, I was very happy to invite him. And uh, we just had a very nice session at my seminar on humane understanding. And I'm looking very much forward to what he has to say today uh, in his talk on empathy and historical understanding. But without further ado, I very much would like to welcome uh, Professor Kohut and look forward to his talk and the discussion afterwards. Uh, and so feel free to ask a lot of questions afterwards. Uh, but if you do that, uh, you should stand up and go to the microphone because uh, the session is recorded, and without you being in front of the microphone, uh, the recorder will not be able to uh, represent your lovely voice and question. So, without further ado. Okay. So this is my first uh, live performance since COVID. It's also the first time I've spoken before a group of people without a mask on. And uh, I appreciate that you don't all have to wear masks uh, at these events, but at Williams, where I teach, you still do. So it's, you gotta give me, cut me some slack that I'm here and not wearing a mask is a big step for me. So I really appreciate that you're wearing masks. That's great. Um, so I am, I'm not really, I would not describe myself as an unduly modest person. I don't think I'm arrogant, but I'm, I wouldn't, I don't think I'm unduly modest. But I have to say, I feel a little bit odd um, coming to talk to you about empathy when you have here Karsten Stuber, who is, I think, arguably the foremost philosopher of empathy in the world. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm a practicing historian, and I had a brief career as a psychotherapist, and I graduated while I was writing my PhD dissertation in history. I graduated, I was a student at the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute and uh, worked briefly as a therapist during that time. So psychoanalysis will play a little bit of a role in this talk. Um, but it just, it just feels a little bit weird for me to be holding forth about a subject that someone else in the room knows a lot more about than I do. Um, and I think, so the question is, why am I here? Um, and I guess I would say two reasons. One is perhaps um, the psychoanalytic um, dimension, which I can offer. And maybe we, if you want to, we can talk about that during the discussion. And I was just in a class in which that figured prominently. And the other thing is I'm an actual working historian, and I've tried to bring philosophical, sociological, to some degree, uh, neuroscientific um, uh, understandings of empathy to bear on studying history. 
Um, but I think it's fair to say that there were three people, you know, whom I learned most from uh, in writing this book, and one of them is Karsten, um, definitely. And the other was probably, is probably the philosopher of history named Dominic Le Capra. And the third is probably my own father, Heinz Kohut, who probably more than any other psychoanalyst is associated with empathy. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that if you ask questions that I have no idea about, that Karsten will get up and answer them because I think he's more likely to be able to do a better job. But I'm really, you know, I, I just, this is not just sort of politeness talk. Um, I learned an incredible amount um, from reading his work, Karsten's work. So this is, you know, I've given many lectures over the course of my career, and some of them are kind of fun lectures and easy to understand and really engaging, and, and this is not necessarily a fun lecture. Uh, this is kind of a hard lecture, uh, at least for his, you know, ordinary historian types. This is uh, quite theoretical. Um, it's quite abstract for the most part. Uh, and I think it's going to be, it's going to be, it's not always going to be the easiest thing in the world to follow. Um, the good news is I know this, um, and now you know this. Uh, and uh, hopefully there's enough repetition that if you tune out and you tune back in, it'll be, Okay, um, but as I say, this is this is uh, this is for a historian at least quite abstract stuff. So um, I'm going to read the lecture um, partly to get through it quickly, uh, just so you can pace yourselves. It's under 40 minutes. Um, so anyway, that's the that's the my introductory comments. <clears throat> Historians use empathy to know the past, but they don't acknowledge that they do. Empathy makes them uneasy. It's a squishy and capacious concept. Its precise meaning is unclear. Empathy connotes feeling, softness, something gendered feminine, perhaps. It implies forgiveness or compassion, perhaps love for the people of the past. As opposed to hard evidence, cold reason, and rigorous logic, Empathy suggests qualities difficult to reconcile with the discipline that still may conceive of itself as an empirical social science. The word empathy is of relatively recent vintage, coined in 1909 by the psychologist Edward Titchener as his idiosyncratic translation of the German Einfühlung, meaning feeling into or feeling one's way inside. Moreover, what we call empathy has frequently been called sympathy, going back at least to David Hume and continuing on well into the 20th century, connoting not compassion, but sympathetic understanding. Indeed, discomfort with Einfühlung has led scholars in Germany to use the English translation of Einfühlung, translated back into German, as empathie. In avoiding the term Einfühlung, scholars perhaps wish to deny that feeling may play a role in knowing. <clears throat> Historians' uneasiness with empathy may not simply derive from its conceptual murkiness or from stereotypical and inaccurate assumptions about the concept. While it relies on evidence, reason, and other uncontroversial ways of knowing in history, empathy also relies upon imagination, insight, sensitivity to people, even emotional resonance. Although these features of empathy may make hard-headed empiricists uncomfortable, they are the qualities that make the practice of history a fascinating, creative, and fully human enterprise. Without those qualities, there could be no understanding of the way past people experienced themselves and the worlds they inhabited. As a result, historians use empathy to know the past even if they almost never acknowledge their reliance on empathy to their readers or to themselves. Historians need to acknowledge, indeed, to embrace empathy's role in historical knowledge, but they also need to think systematically about the concept as it relates to their field, and they need to be self-aware and self-critical in using empathy to know the past. Although, with a few notable exceptions, historians have not focused much attention on empathy in recent years, it has been the subject of a vast and growing literature 
in a wide range of disciplines other than history. The fact that empathy is currently the subject of so much attention in so many different fields confirms its importance, but renders the concept even more muddled. Scholars in various disciplines have developed various definitions of empathy, some complementary and some mutually exclusive. Despite these differences, current discussions of empathy tend to relate to the question of how we know the minds and mental states of others encountered directly, face to face, in the here and now. Empathy's role in knowing the minds and mental states of the people of the past, whom we encounter only indirectly through their expressions and creations, is only occasionally considered in these debates, and then principally because philosophers of history like Diltai and Collingwood were prominent theorizers of empathy. The consideration of empathy's role in historical knowledge, if it occurs at all, tends to be subordinated to knowing others in the present. <clears throat> in those fields where empathy has been the subject of recent attention, the concept has generally been defined in one of five ways. As perspective taking, as effective sharing, as merger, as identification, and as sympathy. The first of these definitions, empathy as perspective taking, is the most relevant to the attempt of historians to know and understand the people of the past. This definition focus, focuses on empathy's cognitive dimension. Empathy in historical knowledge, then, represents our attempt to know and understand past people by adopting their perspective, by imagining our way, by thinking our way, at times even by feeling our way inside their experience. Two concepts developed by the historian and philosopher of history, Reinhard Kozelik, seem particularly applicable to empathy conceived of as perspective taking. In adopting the perspective of past people in our imagination, we reconstruct what Kozelik called their space of experience and their horizon of expectation. By space of experience, Kozelik meant the historical subject's past as it was alive in them in the present moment. By horizon of expectation, Kozelik meant the historical subject's hopes, fears, and sense of what was to come as it too was alive in them in the present moment. Since our space of experience and our horizon of expectation are not merely uniquely personal, but also socially and culturally shared and constructed, we are not always entirely conscious of our experience or of our expectation. Furthermore, experience and expectation exist only in the moment and are constantly changing. With each new moment, our experience of the past changes and with it, our expectation for the future. Although Kozelik never used the word empathy, imagining one's way, thinking one's way, feeling one's way inside the space of experience and horizon of expectation of past people is central to the way I think about empathy as a way to know and understand the human past. <clears throat> Although empathy as a way of knowing in history means adopting the subjective position of the people of the past, the empathizing historian does not occupy the empathic position either completely or all the time. Empathy is always partial and temporary. Thus, in empathy, we simultaneously adopt the perspective of the other while maintaining our own independent sense of self. Indeed, it is the awareness of the distinction between self and other that distinguishes empathy from affective contagion, where the emotional state of, of the other infects the self to become our own emotional experience, as at a bar or a sporting event or a rally. From psychological merger, where one loses oneself in the other. And from identification, where one experiences oneself as the same as the other. In all three cases, contagion, merger, and identification, the boundary between self and other is erased and the observer loses his or her own independent sense of self. There is no loss of self in empathy. 
The philosopher Edith Stein put it neatly, empathy is Einfühlung, feeling into the other, not Einsfühlung, becoming one with the other. Merger and identification then assume that observer and observed are, are the same. Empathy, by contrast, recognizes and appreciates difference even while attempting to know and understand it. Given that empathy is not merely experiencing what the other is experiencing, but a way of knowing the other's experience, contagion, merger, and identification preclude empathy as a form of cognition. While empathizing, one needs a clear sense of the distinction between self and other in order to recognize that the other's experiences belong not to oneself, and conversely, that, one, that one's own experiences do not belong to the other. Even when we experience the feelings of another in empathy, as sometimes happens in psychoanalysis, we need to be aware of the difference between feelings that belong to the other and our own feelings. On the one hand, we need temporarily, temporarily to quarantine our own beliefs in order to know the beliefs of another. On the other hand, in adopting the perspective of the other person, we need, according to Karsten Stuber, to quarantine empathize pretend beliefs from our own cognitive grasp of the world. Empathy as a form of cognition is a deliberate and self-conscious activity that involves a kind of splitting on the part of historians who simultaneously occupy the empathic and the external observational positions we imagine our way inside the experience of the historical subject, while at the same time, we observe the historical subject and ourselves in its place from our own observational vantage point. Thus, even as we empathize, we need to maintain critical distance from our subject's experience to remain self-reflective, attuned to the uniqueness of the subject, and aware of the limited nature of our empathy. The need for the historian to apply empathy self-consciously and self-critically leads to what the philosopher of history, Dominic Le Capra, calls empathic unsettlement. Although Le Capra acknowledges that the term resists precise definition, essential to empathic unsettlement is the historian's pervasive experience of difference, even while attempting to know and understand it. Empathic unsettlement prompts historians to scrutinize their own subjective and empathic responses to ensure that empathy does not become contagion, merger, or identification, that empathy does not lead to histrionic pathos or to simplifying and satisfying closure, but to an understanding that opens up as much as it closes off. It is the attenuated and limited nature of empathy, in fact, that enables us to recognize difference to appreciate that our empathized experience can never fully capture the experience of the other, which, important, which in, an import, in important ways always ultimately escapes our empathic grasp. Not only do historians need to be objectively engaged in the subjective process of empathizing, they also occupy the position of the outside observer in knowing when to adopt the empathic position in the first place. Frequently, it is when something does not make sense from our own external vantage point, or when normal intuitive understanding breaks down, that we deliberately and self-consciously adopt the perspective of the historical subject in our imagination. That is to say, historians adopt the empathic position when they are confronted with an explanatory puzzle. To solve that puzzle, historians adopt the position of the historical subject to understand why the feelings, thoughts, or behaviors that do not make sense to us do make sense from within the experience of the historical subject. And historians return to the position of the outside observer in interpreting, and underst in interpreting the understanding they have gained through empathy, for our interpretations transcend the historical subject's experience in view of the world. Empathy is decidedly not sympathy, a distinction that should make historians more inclined to accept empathy as a way to know and understand the people of the past. 
The notion that empathy and sympathy are synonymous or that empathy inevitably engenders sympathy threatens to make empathic history a maudlin enterprise or even more problematic if, say, empathizing with Nazis also means sympathizing with them. The equation of empathy and sympathy is obviously misplaced. For, the, for as the historian Alain Confino elegantly put it, quotes, one can understand without forgiving and forgive without understanding. That is, one can empathize with people for whom one feels no sympathy, and one can sympathize with people in whose place one could never imagine oneself being. Despite their difference, empathy and sympathy are frequently conflated in popular usage and in academic discourse. As a result, to avoid the problem apparently posed by empathizing with unsympathetic historical figures, most historians consider empathy in relation to victims, not perpetrators, presuming or implying that we can only think or feel our way inside the experience of those who are sympathetic to us. That association is the result of the fact that many scholars tend, wrongly, to see empathy as identification. To share the anthropologist, anthropologist Jonathan Boyarin's view, writing of empathy in relation to Holocaust memory, that quotes, we can only empathize with, feel ourselves into, those we can imagine as, be, those we can imagine as ourselves. But empathy in historical knowledge is not about imagining the people of the past as being like ourselves. Empathy in historical knowledge is recognizing that the people of the past are different from us and then trying to imagine being like them. Indeed, one can and should attempt to empathize with people one finds unsympathetic, even abhorrent. It seems crucial that we attempt to empathize with Nazis, for example. As the historian Christopher Browning wrote in relation to German Reserve Police Battalion 101, which carried out mass killings of Jews during the Second World War in Poland, quotes, the men who carried out these massacres were human beings. This recognition does, does indeed mean an attempt to empathize. What I do not accept, however, are the old cliches that to explain is to excuse, that to understand is to forgive. Explaining is not excusing. Understanding is not forgiving. The notion that one must simply reject the acts of the perpetrators and not try to understand them would make impossible not only my history, but any perpetrator history that sought to go beyond one-dimensional caricature." End quotes. Certainly in my own historical work, I have sought to empathize less with sympathetic victims and more with unsympathetic Nazis and their supporters, and to engender empathy for them on the part of readers, without my having any sympathy for them, and without, I think, making them at all sympathetic to readers. As mentioned earlier, we consciously and deliberately adopt the empathic position, the position of the historical subject, in order to understand feelings, thoughts, and actions of the historical subject that do not make sense to us. The attitudes and behavior of those who carried out or enabled the Holocaust present me, at least, with an explanatory puzzle. To cite one example, I wish to understand how a man ordered to shoot men, women, and children lying naked in a trench could think that order made sense. Although perhaps at the current limit of our empathic capacities, Attempting to understand that man is intellectually and ethically imperative. We have the obligation to try to understand that man, not least to avoid dehumanizing him by closing off our empathy for him as he had closed off empathy for those lying helpless before him in the trench. Just as we can empathize with people for whom we have no sympathy, empathy can be used for unsympathetic purposes. Empathy is not simply and inevitably a force for good, the basis of altruism and the source of compassionate understanding. It can also be used to exploit, harm, defeat, and destroy people. Countless examples of the use of empathy for manipulative or hostile purposes might be cited here, ranging from the calculated dig 
that targets another person's most vulnerable emotional spot through sophisticated advertising campaigns to the interrogator who uses empathy to extract information from a suspect. The psychoanalysts, Heinz Kohut, my dad, cited the effort of the Luftwaffe during World War II, quotes, to create disintegrating panic in those they were about to attack, end quotes, by attaching sirens to the wings of dive, bomb, dive bombers as an example of, quotes, fiendish empathy used for a hostile purpose. It was empathy that allowed them to predict how those exposed to the mysterious noise from the skies would react, end quotes. Through empathy, as the philosopher Martha, Martha Nussbaum put it, en quotes, enemies often become adept at reading the purposes of their foes and manipulating them for their own ends. For the psychoanalyst Warren Poland, quotes, the con man, the demagogue, the exploiter, and the sadist all function best when their empathic skills are sharp. Indeed, the effectiveness of a sadist's cruelty is directly related to the capacity for empathy, to the ability to sense what will hurt most. Empathy, then, is not sympathy. In empathy, I leave my own subjective position in order to adopt the sub subjective position of the other in my imagination. I seek to align myself with the other mentally in that I try to see the world from the other's perspective and emotionally in that I try to feel something of what the other feels. When I experience sympathy, I maintain my own subjective position. I do not adopt the position of the person with whom I sympathize. The other person may feel sorrow or anger. I feel sympathy, an emotion entirely different from the sorrow or anger from the sorrow or anger that the other is experiencing. Sympathy is my feeling for someone else. Empathy is my attempt to, to feel what someone else is feeling. Being clear about one's observational position lifts the fog of confusion surrounding empathy and sympathy. When I empathize, I seek to adopt in my imagination the position of the other. When I sympathize, I regard and react to the other from my own autonomous position. Although empathy and sympathy are demonstrably, demonstrably different, perhaps something humanizing may result from empathy that is in the case of Nazis we may wish to resist. Nevertheless, keeping straight which observational position one occupies in, no, in knowing past people helps resolve the problem of understanding and judgment for the empathizing historian. Initially, the historian occupies the position of the external observer who determines which past feelings, thoughts, and actions one wishes to know and understand. Then the historian deliberately occupies the empathic position, the position of the historical subject, in an attempt to understand those feelings, thoughts, and actions in the terms and experience of the historical subject without endorsing those feelings, thoughts, and actions in any way. And finally, the historian returns to the position of the external observer to assess, perhaps ultimately con to condemn the feelings, thoughts, and actions of the historical subject that have been empathically understood. Conceptualized as perspective taking, historical empathy then is fully compatible with historical judgment. Perhaps as a result of empathically derived understanding, one may regard past people more sympathetically but that increased sympathy is the result of empathy, not empathy itself. And it is demonstrable that sympathy is not the inevitable product of empathy, even if it may sometimes be. The book that I wrote on this topic then seeks to establish empathy as a way to know and understand the people of the past by imagining, thinking, and perhaps even feeling one's way inside their experience. Although empathizing with past people is in no small degree a rational enterprise, our imagination plays a vital role in historical knowledge, enabling historians to know and understand experiences they have never had themselves. In the eternal struggle over whether the present dominates the past or the past dominates the present in historical representation, an empathic historical approach shifts the balance of power in favor of the past, ceding more authority to the people of the past than historians have traditionally been wont to do. 
The past is not some lifeless object awaiting our dissection, and we do not simply determine what we know and write about it. Instead, the people of the past are better thought of less as passive subjects of our investigation and more as active collaborators with whom we are in a cognitive and effective relationship that profoundly influences what we know and write about them. Indeed, our interaction with past people influences us, changes us, making us different than we were before. By reading the historical subject less from the perspective of the present and more from the perspective of the historical subject, empathy enables historians to, to approach the past non-deterministically. By taking seriously the experiences that past people took seriously themselves, empathic history illuminates possibility, not what ultimately happened, but what might have occurred. To cite another example from the Holocaust, empathic history transforms Jews, reduced to the status of victim, into whole complex human beings with a wide range of experiences and expectations having nothing at all to do with the fact that their lives ultimately ended in Auschwitz. Given that the position of the observer determines what he or she is able to see, history written from an empathic vantage point, written from the perspective of the historical subject, is different from history written with the benefit of hindsight and of equal value. <clears throat> to illustrate the different histories that result from assuming the empathic as opposed to the external observational position, let me turn to one of the most notorious and studied events in the history of Nazi Germany, the Wannsee Conference, which was held on 20 January 1942. In fact, the Wannsee Conference has been the subject of two docudramas based on the conference transcript, which was prepared by Adolf Eichmann. The second of these was just shown this past January in prime time on German and Austrian television. Historians have identified the conference as the key moment when the Nazi authorities irrevocably committed themselves to the extermination of the Jews of Europe and see it as having established the bureaucratic basis for the implementation of what the Nazis called the final solution to the Jewish question. Specifically, the SS, conveners of the conference, secured state and Nazi party complicity in the extermination of European Jewry while establishing the SS as the ultimate authority in carrying out the genocide. Although Jews had been killed in Eastern Europe before January 20th, 1942, after the conference, the mass extermination of Jews began in earnest. That, in a nutshell, nutshell is the way the Wannsee Conference has been understood and presented by historians. It is an account of the conference that is strongly influenced by what came after 1942, by the evident historical consequences of the conference. But this reading fails to account well for an issue that seems to have been most urgent and important to the conference participants, an issue to which more than a third of the conference was devoted, and the only issue that apparently provoked heated debate. That issue was the question of what was to be done with people who were racially one half or one quarter Jewish, so-called Mischlinge, and with Jews who were married to non-Jewish Germans. No agreement was reached at the Wannsee Conference, nor at two subsequent conferences, about whether these Mischlinge and full Jews were to be deported to the East and killed there. Although this issue was of central importance to the conference participants, Historians have either ignored it entirely, dismissed it as a pedantic and legalistic tangent, bizarrely set within the conference's lethal endorsement of genocide, or seen it as more or less derivative of the meeting's ultimate outcome, namely the establishment of the bureaucratic basis for the extermination of the Jews of Europe. The relatively low profile in the historical literature of the heated discussion about precisely which Jews were eligible for deportation and death reflects the fact that what is important to historians today based on knowledge of what happened after the conference is different from what was important to the historical participants. If we adopt the empathic position, if following Kozelik, we think our way back into the space of experience 
and the horizon of expectation of the participants at the Wannsee Conference, the compelling importance of the question of whether Mischlinge and Jews in, in mixed marriages were to, be de were to be deported becomes completely understandable. And what was the space of experience of the participants in the Wannsee Conference? It was the fate of the Nazi euthanasia program, which had been officially suspended five months before the Wannsee Conference in the face of opposition from church leaders and of mounting public protest as more and more German families were personally affected by the Nazis' efforts to eliminate what they called life unworthy of life. The euthanasia program was at the heart of the Nazis' biomedical project to create a racially pure and vital community of the people. By preventing those with hereditary illnesses or disabilities from reproducing, the genetic health of the folk would be secured for generations to come. By eradicating the disabled, the chronically or terminally ill, the mentally ill, and other so-called ballast existences, valuable resources devoted to preserving this life, unworthy of life, would be freed to support healthy members of the folk and with the outbreak of the war, the German war effort. Thus, as a result of public opposition, the Nazis had been forced to suspend a program that along with their desire to eradicate the Jewish menace, stood at the very top of their racial agenda. Hitler's termination of the euthanasia program on 24 August 1941 exacerbated Nazi concerns that popular protests could interfere with their other essential racial project, the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. Thus, the official termination of the euthanasia program in the face of public opposition was the space of experience of the participants in the Wannsee Conference. And their horizon of expectation was that the final solution to the Jewish question in Europe might suffer the same fate as the euthanasia program were public protests to erupt in Germany at the deportation of half and quarter Jews and Jews married to non-Jewish Germans at the, deport, at the deportation, that is, of Jews intimately related and otherwise connected to many non-Jewish Germans. Thus, if we adopt the empathic perspective, the perspective of the participants in the Wannsee Conference, the question of what was to be done with German Mischlinge and Jews and mixed marriages appears to have been, in its own right, perhaps the crucial issue to be considered and decided at the conference. On the one hand, the participants in the Wannsee Conference wanted to eliminate as many Jews and Mischlinge as possible. On the other hand, they feared that if large numbers of half and quarter Jews with many non-Jewish German, non German relatives and Jews in mixed marriages, particularly if these had produced children, if those, Germans, if those Jews were deported, public protest might seriously compromise the Nazis' ability, ability to carry out their extermination project. To the best of my knowledge, no historian has explicitly related the heated and lengthy discussion about what to do with Mischlinge and Jews in mixed marriages at the Wannsee Conference to the role that public protest had played in bringing the euthanasia program to an official end. Nor, to the best of my knowledge, have historians of the euthanasia program connected its forced official suspension to the discussions at the villa in Wannsee. Why then have historians failed to see this connection? As was suggested above, given the advantages of hindsight afforded them by the outside observational positions, historians have tended to understand the Wannsee Conference more on the basis of what came after the meeting than on what came before. <clears throat> By contrast, the historical participants understood the Wannsee Conference on the basis of what had come before, their space of experience, and based their attitudes and actions on what, given their space of experience, they anticipated the future might bring, their horizon of expectation. The history of the Wannsee Conference is different depending on whether one adopts the empathic position or that of the external observer. Afforded the benefit of hindsight, the external observer reads the conference in light of the subsequent extermination of the Jews of Europe, seeing it as having, in the words of historian Mark Roseman, quotes, cleared the way for genocide, end quotes. That is an authentic, valuable, and significant reading of the conference. 
Nevertheless, the reading yielded by the empathic observational position is also authentic, valuable, and significant. It focuses more sharply on the lengthy and heated debate at the conference about what to do with Mischlinge and Jews in mixed marriages and provides a compelling explanation of that debate. It also brings contingency to light, illuminating not only what happened after the conference, but also what might have happened. Seeing the conversation at the Vanze conference as responding to the suspension of the euthanasia program reveals possibilities foreseen, and in this case feared, that might have prevented the full extent of the genocide. Indeed, viewing the Vanze conference from an empathic perspective brings home in an intellectually and emotionally compelling way how tenuous Nazi officials felt their plan to exterminate the Jews, the Jews of Central Europe to be, how vulnerable, how much at risk were popular protests against it to occur. The decision officially to suspend the euthanasia program had been a bitter blow to the Nazis. Therefore, the issue of how to handle Mischlinge and Jews in mixed marriages was of, vital, was of vital importance, for the fate of the final solution to the Jewish question in Europe appeared to them to hang in the balance. An empathic history of the Wannsee Conference conveys the Nazis' fear of public protest against the final solution in a particularly compelling way. That fear, reflected in the decision to suspend the euthanasia program and in the heated debate at the Wannsee Conference about Mischlinge and Jews in mixed marriages, suggests that popular protest might well have interfered with the Nazi extermination project. An empathic history of the Wannsee Conference, one that focuses on the experience of the participants, their hopes, and above all, their fears, affirms powerfully and tragically that popular protests might have hampered the Nazis' efforts to exterminate the Jews of Europe. In considering empathy and historical understanding, I have distinguished then between the external and the empathic observational positions. The historian occupying the external observational position views historical phenomena from his or her own perspective with all the benefit of hindsight, distance, and scope that the external observational position affords. The historian occupying the empathic observational position seeks to view historical phenomena from the perspective of the people of the past, to view and understand their world as they themselves viewed and understood it. Nevertheless, his empathizing historians also occupy the external observation, observational position before, after, and even while empathizing with past people. Because even while empathizing, historians must remain themselves, empathy is always attenuated and partial. Even as empathy seeks to know and understand difference, empathy affirms otherness. Historians' efforts, effort to adopt the perspective of the historical subject must be self-aware and self-reflective. Although exceedingly difficult, it is important that historians try to be aware of which observational position they are adopting at any given moment, not least because the external and the empathic observational positions yield different histories. In part because of that difficulty, it is my impression that historians are only rarely aware of when they are empathizing and when they are not. One of my take home messages is that they need to be. For when employed del deliberately and self-consciously, empathy is a legitimate and important mode of historical inquiry. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed your talk. Now, I'm wondering how is it possible then for the empathic historian to know if he is right uh, empathizing in the right way? Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, a, it's a fantastic question. Um, because, um, so the other thing I didn't talk about was psychoanalysis. And I think in psychoanalysis, the, th the therapist or psycho psycho ther psychoanalytic psychotherapy or psychodynamic psychotherapy, whatever you want to call it, talk therapy really, the therapist 
has an empathic understanding and communicates it to the patient or the client. And the client says, you've understood me, or no, that's wrong. So there is a kind of response that the, that the, the subject of, of one's empathy, they have a kind of autonomous ability to say whether it's right or not. And I think um, in history, that's not the case. So I think, um, you know, the, it's a little of a bit of a stretch, but the kind of, the comparison in history is really the reader of the history. And I think one of the things, you, you, does the reader find the interpretation, the empathically derived interpretation compelling? And I think one of the things, I don't think historians ever think about this in writing history is that you kind of need to bring the reader along in your empathic work or with your empathic work. You need to kind of, you don't just present the conclusion that you've reached based on your empathic immersion, but you try to create a situation where the reader, her or himself, also experiences something of that empathic immersion and therefore there's a kind of synchronicity, and that's not the right word, there's a certain harmony between, synergy was the word, harmony between the reader's responses to the historical material being presented and the historian's, with the st still with the, being the opportunity for the reader to reach a different conclusion. So I think there's partly like just the inherent logic, this is true of any explanation, the, you know, how, how well does, does the explanation account for the evidence is one of the, is one of the, this, I don't ask, ask Professor Stuber about this, but I believe that's one of the ways that explanations are assessed, and that's certainly true of empathy too. Um, and I think, you know, there's also the additional fact of like how well does this interpretation fit in with the historical interpretations that are then kind of about which there is a consensus. Um, but it's, it's, that's the difference between history. There is no ultimate arbiter in the way that in therapy, the patient is the ultimate arbiter. Right, just a quick follow up. Uh, so it is the case then that the empathic historian is still in dialogue with other historians who are using different methods? Well, not necessarily methods. I think, again, I think all historians are empathizing all the time unless they're not interested. If they're interested in people, they're empathizing. I think it's inevitable that they're empathizing. So I know. Right. Um, and I have to say, you know, I don't know what it's like in philosophy or in other fields, but in history, I think when I'm writing the book, I have colleagues in my head that I'm worried about. Um, you know, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? The, or I'm hoping that they get really provoked by some idea. You know, there's all kinds of things going on there. Um, so I think um, you do have in your head, like, the audience that you're writing for. Um, but I also think one of the things that, that empathy brings to light, and this is something that historians are well aware of, is that, does it, you know, no longer do historians think of themselves as scientists, really, as objective observers who have no, with their own personality, plays no role in what they see. The, the truth kind of emerges from the past or the truth is discovered in the past if you do meticulous research. Um, no historian really thinks that, I think, today. But um, I think what's, what's, what empathy reveals is that two empathic historians who are even consciously, deliberately trying to empathize, who've had two different, ex totally different sets of experiences, can read the same event in two different ways that are both empathic, that both capture some dimension of, for lack of a better word, the truth of that event. Um, but there is no one like interpretation. And I think it's fair to say with the passage of time, you know, uh, Events like the Vanze Conference may not even be important anymore. People will be looking at completely different things. But, you know, every generation rewrites its own history or rewrites history. And I think that's, it's not to say that it's just completely, this is, I really dislike the idea that history, which historians, it's so ahistorical. It drives me nuts. Like, historians think that they have complete power to, like, they create the past by writing about it. As if the past has no authority of its own. I think the past has immense authority and has a great in impact on historians and what they see and what they write and that the people of the past, as I said in the talk, are 
your collaborator as much as, certainly more than your just like a, something to be dissected. But I think that different historians um, will collaborate with the people of the past in different ways based on who those historians are, and I think that's great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Hi, Annie. I'm going to start with an indulged story. Um, she uh, grew up a block away from me. Yeah, many years ago, <laughs> one professor, Kohat, rather sternly, calmly but sternly, scolded me about splashing the water, splashing the water um, in the apartment building where you lived because the um, carp, the goldfish, would be disturbed. And he said, you must think about how the goldfish feels. And one young cohort comes along and says, don't worry, Annie, I know how you feel. <laughs> I, I don't remember any of this. I, you must have been 12. And I no, my father's a little scary. He was definitely scary. And uh, I would not have wanted him scolding me. Using empathy to scold you, um, empathy with a goldfish, yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I, and when I said I know what you feel, I think I know, I meant I know what it feels like to have him talk to you like that. I took it that way. Anyway, I, I <laughs> thought that would be it. I started with two questions, but I think you may have answered one of them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether to ask you to talk to us about the em empathic historian that you're getting at and contextual hermeneutics in history, so sort of how those play with each other, or what happens when you have six or 10 highly empathetic historians looking at the same material mm -hmm. and the subjectivity of that role. So right. pick one. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure I know what conceptual hermeneutics is, and this is where you're getting me not being the philosopher, but I think if I'm, I'm guessing. Um, uh, contextual, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah I'm, I'm guessing that it means that what one does is one simply recre recreates a context and then if you can completely recreate the context, you can kind of understand the person inhabiting the con context. And that assumes, wrongly in my view, that um, human beings are purely the product of their culture or their circumstances. It gives no place for any individual identity outs or autonomy or a self outside of the concept, the context which creates them. Um, it reduces people to context, and I think it also kind of, I mean, this is Collingwood a little bit, it also assumes that the historian and the person of the past are the same, and that if you put, if I'm the historian and you put me in my imagination in this context, I will behave exactly as those people in the past did, because we're kind of interchangeable. And so I resist that notion. I think context is obviously really important. You really need to know you know, what the person's, you know, the world around them was like, what the context was. But what I really like about this concept of Koselleck, of space of experience and horizon of expectation, is I think it does leave room for individuality and individual um, variance and doesn't privilege context. It's about people's experience of the context more than the context disaggregated from the experience. So. Uh, I find it a really nice way of giving, um, paying attention to, seeing value in, grasping the importance of reconstructing the context of the past, but also goes beyond that and focuses the historian on the people and how they uniquely experience that context. Does that help? Thank you. It's given me a lot to think about. I'm an art historian, and, and the applications of this to that field have me spinning. So thank you. Thanks. Tom, that was a very stimulating talk. I want to ask you about, I think, for me, one of the biggest takeaways historically, from a historian's perspective, of what you said, and that is how the, this empathetic way of studying the Vanze conference perpetrators teaches us something huge, which is how afraid and vulnerable powerful people are. Right. How powerful people basically live in fear. Right. 
I think that that's really huge, and I think uh, it certainly perhaps is very relevant at this moment. Absolutely. <laughs> with Putin, perhaps also with Trump, but certainly with Putin right now. Um, and I think also uh, it, it sort of turns on its head the way we often think of everyday life in Nazi Germany and what a totalitarian dictatorship is and what it means to be an ordinary person under that kind of dictatorship and how much power is, it's possible that those who felt, allegedly felt afraid and therefore didn't, didn't, didn't uh, step in the way were, uh, were they really afraid or who was really afraid? That, I think that's a huge question. And I think, uh, you know, if we think about a couple of things that some of us in this room have read, uh, some, of, some of us in this room have read uh, Eric Johnson and Carl Roybond, their study of uh, whether uh, ordinary people felt afraid or not in the 1930s. And others of, his, of us in the room have read Browning's book, Ordinary Man, and whether those perpetrators felt afraid or why they acted the way they did. And there is the famous story that the commander cried as he gave the order and allowed people to step out of line and do not do the killing, and yet people did the killing anyway because they were afraid of something else, I guess, which was peer pressure. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that whole phenomenon of who was afraid and exactly what they were afraid of and how this approach perhaps can help us understand that from the top down as well as from the bottom up. Right. No, I th you know, it's, I think, you know, it's just, I mean, it's in the talk, but I think it's just a really <laughs> profound observation. I mean, I think, you know, Hitler was pretty fanatical. But I think on some level, he, you know, I think you should, I think in general one needs to believe people's rhetoric. I think generally people may in the beginning say things and then, you know, that they don't actually believe. But ultimately, I think they come to believe it because it's too hard to, believe, to, to live lying all the time. So, I, you know, I think, you know, God, heaven knows what, you know, Putin thought originally. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure now he believes in what he says in that endless speech that he gave. And I think, um, you know, I think the Nazis, um, I think the Nazis were really scared a lot of the time. I mean, you have to, again, empathizing with Nazis, you have to recognize these are not traditional politicians. Um, this, is some, this is a comment that a student made in a class of mine that I thought was really great, which is these are not anything like any politician that had been in power before. I, Trump has, I mean, he's no Nazi, trust me. But, you know, he again was someone who's out of the mold and, the Nazis had no kind of established um, structures or institutions or traditions that they could kind of find some support in that could help them shape their experience and their horizon of expectation. They were really quite radical in what they were proposing. This had not been attempted or even thought of before in the way that they thought of it. So I think, uh, I think the fact is they were scared to death about about this, and I don't think we tend to see them as all powerful, terrifying figures and fail to understand how frightened they were. And I think frightened people often do the worst things um, out of their terror. So, yeah, I think that's a really great point. Hi, Professor. <laughs> uh, I just have a question about the link you see between empathy and sympathy, in that it seemed like you were suggesting that. It's possible to have empathy for somebody without having sympathy for them. Right. But I just wonder, doesn't some degree of sympathy seem to inevitably follow from empathy in that we seem to have some feelings of natural goodwill for somebody that increase in proportion to how well we understand them? Like, right. say you could have some level of empathy for a Nazi soldier just based on like the orders he'd been given, but like, say you were able to go back into his childhood and you understood like right. his father, wouldn't your feelings of sympathy naturally increase based on that? I think, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, all of us know this, every person in this room has had their feelings hurt by somebody. And if you can empathize with that person and why they said what they said to you, it takes some of the sting out. I don't think there's any question about that. And I think it's very, so I think it has to do with how deep the empathy goes. So I think you can, this is not my idea, but I think it's right. It's horrifying to think about. But I think the Nazi authorities designed the extermination project in a way that involved a certain limit empathy with Jews. Um, you know, the idea of having in Auschwitz, you're going to have a shower and you're going to have coffee 
and here's your hook, and there's a number. You take your number, so after you come back out of the shower, that's, that's based on, that's like the sirens that my dad talked about on the wings. There's a, that's empathy. I don't think they sympathize one whit with them. But it's a fairly shallow um, form of empathy, I would say. Um, but nonetheless, it's still putting, the, if I were, but I think the bottom line where what empathy does do if it goes beyond this most superficial level, it humanizes people. And I don't know if humanizing is the same as sympathy, but it's closer. So I actually think, you know, the most radical thing that I said in the talk, I think, is the idea that we need to empathize with the guy with a gun in front of the in, in front of the trench because if you don't empathize with him, you're dehumanizing him. You're 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 seeing him as not a person but a sort of an unintelligible monster, and. And, and that's not, that's doing what, that's what he thought about those, the people in the trench before him. He thought, they, these aren't really human beings like me in any way, shape, or form. I just will kill them. Um, so uh, I think that, I think there is something, at least I'll say humanizing, and frequently it does lead to sympathy, but there is a kind of superficial empathy, like the thing, the example, the reason I put it in, such a famous in psychoanalysis, this whole thing about the Stuka bombers with the sirens, um, I don't think there's much sympathy for the people on the ground, if that's empathy. Thank you. Uh, you seem to define empathy as kind of like running a simulation of another person's internal experiences as a means to understand their external decisions. Should, should I say that again, or just leave? No, I, I got it. So. In that way, does that somehow mean that the social aspect of history reinforces the scientific aspect by somewhat recontextualizing the importance of various things? So I got the first part. So the first part is, is empathy kind of running a simulation in your head, right? And then how does that relate to the social? <clears throat> uh, the social aspect of history as a social science reinforcing the scientific aspect. If, it, if thought of as a simulation, it's like we, it becomes compatible with, with science? Yeah, kind of your innate knowledge of humanity, your ability to understand, mm -hmm. at least in some level, what led to their decisions mm -hmm. allows you to more accurately assign what would be the weight to each factor in the decision and more accurately contextualize each uh, aspect of history. So I still not sure I follow. Can you, can you can someone can you say it? Again? Uh, in essence, does the social reinforce the scientific in history? Okay. Well, again, now you know. Again, so much of these discussions is what do we mean by these words? Like, what is science? Um, and it's this is where you know in certain languages things are better. So with that word. German is way better because the word in German is Wissenschaft, and that applies to the natural sciences and the human sciences. And there is no, um, there is not this kind of. To me, the notion that what I think of as of science is very much like, you know, maybe it's a kind of old-fashioned vision of science, which is um, sort of like the doctor with a white coat, or uh, the person in the lab um, with a microscope. Um, who, who feels no personal connection to that which is being studied and who is, you know, objectively, dispassionately um, attempting to discover the truth about whatever it is that's being discovered. That was the way, you know, so history, you know, ancient 19th century history is associated with Leopold von Ranke is you know, history is a science sort of like that, where you, the historian, he, he, he even wished that he could efface himself, that he himself had no subjectivity and that he could just go without any prejudices or any preconditions or any kind of set of experiences that interfered. He could study the past and he would, if he was really good and did his careful research, he would discover the truth about the past. And any, this gets back to the earlier question, any historian, would arrive at exactly the same conclusion because the truth was to be found in the past and the historian's own contribution 
to what to creating that truth was kind of eradicated. So that's kind of my what I'm thinking of is, and I, you know, we were talking about this earlier when I went to graduate school at the University of Minnesota. It was very clear that history was a social science. It was not a, a, it was not part of the humanities, and at the University of Chicago where. Annie and my dad both taught. Um, you know, if you're in history, you could march with the historian, with the social scientists, or you could march with the humanists. And I would, of course, march with the humanists. Um, but I think, you know, I think part of maybe what I the confu confusion is that <clears throat> I have a particular understanding of what scientific history is, and the scientific history. That, it, that dominated history in the 70s when I was in graduate school and I felt totally alienated and, and unspoken to was super, it was about structures and processes and human beings played no role at all. And you know, if you, I can suggest books that you could read written during that period, the most famous, you know, the works, the, you know, the pre premier social scientific historian in Germany is Hans Ulrich Wehler and I hate his books, but they're very good, but they're, they're totally depopulated. Um, and he was a scientist in the way that I, you know, the way I'm thinking of it. Um, so I'm sorry, I probably didn't answer your question, but I think, I think if I understand, I mean, I think that one could, if you bring in the social, there are certain th things from outside the simulation that you're bringing in um, that maybe could be fit into the simulation in some ways. The con it gets back to the context question, I guess. Uh, and I think maybe we can, maybe we could all agree on what the context of the past was. I don't know. Thank you. That actually does answer the question. Hi, I have a question that kind of touches back on that dynamic between empathy and sympathy. And I was wondering, in your experience, is, empathy, is like history from a place of empathy kind of like a double-edged sword where you kind of get some pushback on it because it's empathetic towards like these groups that are like normally like dehumanized like in those histories? Like do you receive pushback from that or it, do you kind of view it as like a necessity in order to like paint that full picture? And how do you communicate that to your audience? Okay, so one of the most traumatic moments of my pedagogical life was when I was teaching a class on 20th century Germany, and I wanted, the, the students had to read selections from Hitler's Mein Kampf. That's his name now, I can't remember his name. And, and they were, the, the assignment was, I want you to pretend like you're a Nazi. I don't say this anymore now, but I said it then because I was naive. Uh, you pretend you're Hitler, and I want you to make the case for why this view of the world is right. And this student got up outraged. And at first, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And I do remember the line at one point in, the, in this attack on me for doing this. He said, do your colleagues know what you're doing in here? And I, it took me the longest time to figure out what he was talking about because the, for me, empathy was so ingrained, partly I think because of the way I grew up. My father's disciplining people, little kids and the apartment building using empathy. Um, so it just never occurred to me that he could find that offensive. His last name was Barth. Morgan Barth, yes. So anyway, after about 15 minutes of hell, I finally figured out what it was that he didn't like. He didn't like me seemingly sympathizing or empathizing with Nazis. I think he thought I was sympathizing. And once I figured it out, I was able to explain it to him. And I think he, he totally came around at the end. And he wrote many letters of recommendation for Morgan. I think he's a teacher now. Um, but I think, um, I think what's really important with so much of and the whole discussion of empathy is just being really clear about what you mean. And if you, if you make it very clear that, you know, the, what we've just been talking about with understanding and the relationship between understanding and maybe greater sympathy for people or humanizing people, if you make all that explicit, I think a lot of the problems go away. It certainly did with Morgan, but I have to tell you, it was just, it was awful. And I was really traumatized because I was so not expecting this response. It just, no student had ever done this before. 
And now I'm very careful. Um, but, you know, to be perfectly honest, um, I think the way I teach um, Nazi Germany, I can do because I have relatives who were killed in the Holocaust. And I think if I had relatives who had been in the SS, it might be a little harder. So I actually talk about that in the class. I'm very open with the students that, you know, what the way I teach this period, um, I let you, I've let you know that, you know, half my family was killed in the Holocaust. Um, and I talk about, like, it might be very, might be much more difficult if half my family, you know, had served in the Waffen SS or something. So um, I think just being explicit and open about these things, but it's, you know, again, I was just, Morgan just, he floored me. And then I just have a quick follow-up to that. Do you think there's a place for like sympathetic histories then? Hmm. So what I don't get, so that if you read the historical literature about empathy, I referenced it in the talk, it's all, almost all about victims, as victims, not as anything beyond victims. And it's kind of, there's something, I don't know, it's very much understood in terms of emotional resonance, that you, the historian, feels what the victims felt or conveys the suffering of the victims to the reader. And that's what a lot of, like Dominic Lecapro, whom I quoted there, who's very hard to understand, unlike Carson Stuber, um, is, you know, he's very negative about that, as is another historian named Carolyn Dean, who's at Yale. She also is quite skeptical about, you know, this. But, but if you don't think of empathy as being about, primarily about feeling, I don't think, you know, most people, maybe there's some of it, but I think mostly when you're reading history, it's an intellectual project. It's not really an emotional project. Yes, emotion seeps in. I mean, there's a really, really nice book by Marion Kaplan about Jews, including her family, who fled from Germany through France to Portugal and then came to mostly the United States. And, you know, it's, it's great because you do feel for these people. They're not reduced to victims because they actually weren't. You get that they didn't know that they wouldn't be victims. They didn't know that the Germans weren't going to conquer Portugal. They didn't know that the Portuguese authorities were not going to send them to Germany, at least initially. Um, so it conveys, in a kind of emotional way, their experience. But it's not a simple suffer experience of suffering um, and victimhood, and that I would have a problem with. Come on, Julia. I think this was a great talk and a great discussion. And so we should thank our speaker for inspiring. Thanks.